Hi everyone, this is the final enzyme video and it is going to be about how we can turn enzymes off. Because remember, every enzyme is specific for its own unique reaction. Well, maybe that chemical reaction is only important during starvation conditions. Well, if the cell isn't starving, then that reaction doesn't need to happen and that enzyme needs to be turned off. So we use, well, there are molecules called inhibitors, which shut off enzymes, right? Inhibitors inhibit the action of enzymes, okay? So let's go ahead and go back to that original enzyme that I used, okay? And so I've told you that my substrate, and I'm sorry, this one's a little big, but that's okay. My substrate is here, let's pretend that's molecule A. That's my substrate, okay? And so normally the substrate is going to bind to this active site. So let's go ahead and label that again. So here's our active site. And we know it's the active site because that is a triangular shape, which is the same shape as our substrate. Over here, this guy, our allosteric site, it is a square, right? So our triangle is not going to fit in there. Okay, it's an E allosteric site. All right, so we know which site is our active site because the shape matches our substrate. Now, I can't erase here, so I'm not gonna draw a bunch of arrows, but normally this substrate is going to bind to the active site. The chemical reaction will occur and it'll spit out a, a product of a different shape, okay? Um, but what if we don't want this enzyme to be on? We don't want the substrate to bind and the product to be made. Well, we're going to have an inhibitor, okay? And there are um, three different types of inhibition that we're going to talk about. This first type is going to be competitive inhibition. And the reason it's called competitive inhibition is because the inhibitor is going to be competing for that active site. Remember, the active site is where the reaction occurs. That is the money-making site, okay? So in order for the inhibitor to compete for the active site, it's gonna have to be a similar shape, right, to that active site, um, because it's gonna have to bind there. And so, um, Let's just make this, because I'm not very artistic, let's just make this a narrower triangle, maybe kind of like this. Okay, it's not the exact same shape, but it, it's close enough that it can get in there and induce that enzyme to kind of hold it a little snugger, okay? So this is gonna be my inhibitor. Now it could be a slightly different shape as long as it resembles the shape of the active site. Okay, it can serve as an inhibitor, inhibitor, there we go. Okay, and so what will happen is when the inhibitor is a similar shape to the substrate, it's gonna compete for this active site. Okay, and when it is able to bind, so normally it's gonna be, I don't know, pretty close to this shape. So just work with me here, so there it is. And so what's the problem with this inhibitor binding to the active site? <clears throat> well, if the inhibitor is in there, can the substrate bind too? Nope, right? And so what's happening here is the inhibitor is going to block the active site, okay? And when the active site is blocked, the consequence of that is the substrate cannot bind. Substrate cannot bind. And if the substrate cannot bind, then no reaction happens, okay? So we've essentially turned off this enzyme because we've confused it by adding an inhibitor, <coughs> okay? So again, with competitive inhibition, the inhibitor is competing with the substrate for the active site. And when the inhibitor gets there first, it physically blocks the active site. So the substrate cannot get in. If the substrate can't get into the active site, no reaction occurs and no product is made. Okay, so rather than trying to spend a lot of time erasing and redrawing this, I'm just going to change shape. Okay, so I'm actually going to rewrite this number one here in purple. So you know that all the purple text um, 
has to do with competitive inhibition. But there's another type of inhibition. And in this case, the inhibitor is not going to want anything to do with the active site. Okay? And so, <coughs> excuse me, we call this non-competitive inhibition. Okay, because again, the only thing worth competing for is the active site. That's where the reaction happens. So if there's no competition, uh, that means the active site is not involved. Okay, so with non-competitive inhibition, we don't care about the active site. We care about this allosteric site. Because remember, the allosteric site is all about regulation. That was supposed to be a parenthesis. I'm not sure why the computer decided against that. There we go. So what's going to happen is when the inhibitor matches the shape of the allosteric site, okay, so now if you're drawing this, um, I would redraw it and get rid of this purple inhibitor for the competitive inhibition because I don't want you to think that these are happening at the same time. This is an either or situation, but if I if I push clear, it's going to erase everything, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and cross out this purple one just so you know that it has nothing to do with non-competitive inhibition, okay? So what actually happens is in this case, um, the inhibitor is going to come all the way over here. Now I'm just getting messy. And it is going to bind to the allosteric site, okay? When anything binds to a protein, it kind of changes shape. Hence that induced fit we talked about earlier. Whenever anything attaches to a protein, it automatically changes shape, right? Just like when we attach to something, like if we pick up a, a tiny human, right? Isn't our body changing? Our arms are changing shape. Our hip kind of sticks out if the kid's sitting on your hip, right? And so we kind of change shape when things attach to us too, right? So same thing here. But, oops, I have no idea how I did that, sorry. What happens though, okay, so step one here, is the inhibitor bound, inhibitor binds the allosteric site. I'm going to abbreviate that as allocyte just to speed this up a little bit. Okay. And when the inhibitor binds the allosteric site, the enzyme changes shape. So the triangle is science talk for change. Okay. So the enzyme changes shape. And this is actually going to have an interesting consequence. And I'm going to sketch it in a second but this is going to warp the active site, okay? It's gonna, the shape change is gonna affect the active site. So I know this is getting a little crazy of a drawing, all right? Um, but see how this active site is originally triangular, right? So our substrate can bind. When this allosteric inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it, the, the shape change is gonna completely warp this enzyme. Okay, so now imagine that this is the shape of the enzyme, okay? So now, right, and maybe it's even crazier, right? It's not at all triangular, okay? And so if the enzyme is now this new shape here, the substrate no longer fits, okay? So it warps the active site such that the substrate can no longer bind. Okay, well, what happens if the substrate can't bind, then there's no reaction, okay? All right, I'm going to clear this, and I'm going to just do a very simple sketch to, to kind of show this, because the, the picture did get a little messy. All right, so if we're saying originally the enzyme looked kind of like this, okay, again, here's our active site. Once the competitive inhibitor is in there, so let me kind of draw it. So he's in here. I should have picked a different color. That's okay. So there's my allosteric site. He's in here, my inhibitor. And what that does is it kind of warps this whole protein, okay? Maybe it's this dramatic, maybe it's not. But the point is the active site is no longer conducive for the substrate, okay? It's no longer triangular and the substrate cannot bind, okay? So binding of this inhibitor warps the active site such that the substrate cannot bind. All right, our last type of inhibition that I wanna talk about, so this is number three, 
is called feedback inhibition. And this is where the final product that's made actually shuts down the metabolic pathway that created it. So let's go back to the example of we have molecule A makes B, B can then be converted into C, C can be converted into D, and let's for simplicity's sake go one more step. Okay, so our goal here, the cell needs to make um, product E. Now remember, an enzyme can only catalyze one reaction. So enzyme one is gonna convert A to B, enzyme two is gonna convert B to C, and enzyme three converts C to D. Hopefully you understand that enzymes are specific at this point, and a fourth enzyme is gonna convert D to E. Well, as long as the cell needs E, E is gonna be used up as soon as it's made. But what happens when conditions no longer require molecule E? Well, now we don't need this entire metabolic pathway to be occurring, right? So we need to shut it down. But if we don't need E, we probably don't need molecule D, which means we probably don't need C or B, right? We don't need anything at this point because all of these are involved um, or all of these exist to make molecule E. So we need to shut this whole pathway down. And so what actually ends up happening is once we no longer need E, it starts to build up in the cell. And then this molecule actually serves as an inhibitor for the very first enzyme and it shuts it down. And by inhibiting this first enzyme, then A will never be converted to B, B to C, so on and so forth. Okay, and so then eventually we don't have any extra E in the cell and the cell is happy, okay? So essentially, this final molecule is going to shut down the first enzyme in this pathway. So it's called feedback, right? Because the product is feeding back into the pathway. Specifically, it's shutting it down. It's inhibiting it. All right, y'all, that is the end of the enzyme content. So let me know.